Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update. Ah, wait a second. I had to join Twitter Live, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live, so I'm going to uh, redo the intro. Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about the importance of ocean stewardship and how people can help care for our oceans and beaches with special guests, Dr. Ian Kerr, CEO of the Ocean Alliance in Massachusetts, Dr. Wendy Marshall, CEO and President of the Ocean Institute in, at Dana Point in California, Craig Dudenhofer, Chief Innovation Officer of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and the Ocean Solutions Accelerator co-founder, also in California, and Manny Oliva, CEO of the Blue Point Conservation Science in California. Oceans, oceans. When I was growing up, oceans were infinite. Oceans were deep. Oceans were unfathomable. I mean, literally unfathomable. And and when I originally came from the U.S. to uh, to Europe, um, I traveled on an ocean liner. Believe it or not, I'm that old. And and you were you were in the middle of the ocean, and and it was it, it was a resource that that had no boundaries. But we're learning increasingly that that's just not true. When we have microplastics basically everywhere in our food supply where microplastics are being found in the Arctic and the Antarctic and the further in the furthest reaches. And you're seeing these these substances that are dropped in the ocean just appearing all over the earth. It's it's amazing to to think about global um, fish stocks collapsing uh, and and all of, of these impacts that are seriously affecting us because the oceans are not infinite. Ian, let's start with you and, and let's just talk a little bit about your perspective on the oceans as a finite research resource and what that means for our stewardship of, of our oceans. Well, copy that, Mark. And thank you for inviting me here today to be with this great panel. I know a few of the people here. So um, I think People don't seem to understand that it is in our own very self-interest to have healthy oceans. I mean, our motto is actually healthy whales, healthy oceans, healthy humans. I mean, you know, the, the oceans are the largest mediating force on this planet. But the problem is the oceans are downhill from everything and gravity never sleeps. So the detritus from our consumer lifestyles sort of inexorably makes its way down into the oceans. And it's funny because um, America's first environmentalist, Henry David Thoreau, said, we do not associate the idea of antiquity with the oceans as we do the land. So here really comes the problem. When you look out over the oceans today, they look unchanged on the surface, but underneath, you know, it's a bit of a nightmare. So it's it's how do we engage people with this invisible problem? And I, and I appreciate you um, obviously putting together this discussion. From Ocean Alliance's perspective, just so, you, just so you know, another big problem with ocean research is um, it's a prerogative of the privilege. It's expensive to get out on the ocean and collect data. So we need more affordable tools, more adaptable tools that will be used by more people across the globe. And as I know, you know, I could talk for the next two hours on that, but I'll end it there and just say Ocean Alliance is very excited to be bringing in affordable tools, utilizing new technologies to try to democratize ocean science and research. Let's talk about that idea of, of the oceans because and, and the, the uh, oceans being the purview of uh, those people with means. I don't think that that's necessarily true, Ian. If you take a look at... Uh, places in the United States or the G7, that might be uh, arguable. But if you look across the world, oceans are basically uh, used by all sorts of different people to make a living. And that that uh, prospect is actually being threatened by the very pollution that is coming from the consuming societies. Um, uh, Wendy, how do you see this, this idea of, of the oceans and increasing our understanding and our appreciation of the oceans. Are we talking a little bit about science on the one hand, but are we also talking about marketing, marketing this idea that the oceans are important? 
Um, I would agree. Um, so just very quickly, thank you again for inviting us today. I'm Wendy from Ocean Institute. Um, and I think I, I love that you started with your mission. Our mission is using the ocean as our classroom. We inspire children to learn. Um, although I, you know, we expand that across the the ages. Um, but I, you know, I come up from the ranks as an educator. So my first field trip to with a class as a fourth grade teacher was to the Dana Point Harbor where the Ocean Institute sits. And I could see the power of giving kids a connection to the ocean. This is, you know, a school that was 11 miles from the beach in Los Angeles. And this is getting back to the democratization of the ocean, you know, access and education. I never had a student who'd ever been to the ocean before. So it's a big ask for people to change their behavior, think about their behavior, understand their behavior. If at best, all they see is this gorgeous blue ocean, they, but they probably don't even see that. Um, so I do, I would, I would tweak that a bit marketing issue for sure. But because I work in the education space, primarily with K-12, I would say it's a curriculum issue. Are we treating how we're presenting ocean understanding and ocean exploration and innovation and research and the prestige that can go with that, you know, the, as a, as a treasured field, um, are we building that, you know, like we do other fields um, from the very start with kids. And I would say no. Um, and what's unfortunate about that is it's such a motivating backdrop to teach math or science, you know, STEM poetry, art. I mean, the ocean, you know, gets into every part of any curriculum and is truly a hub which for me was the first theme I taught when I was a fourth grade teacher. And I could see that it was just absolutely so sticky. And in every section of our lives, it touches us. Um, but I would say the marketing issue from my perspective is the curriculum piece. It, you bake it into that, you've paved the way for everything else. So we have we have the science piece. We have the education piece, particularly the K through 12 education piece. Uh, Craig, you want to weigh in on on how you see the um, the, the mission of these organizations to um, to advance not only knowledge but also embrace of the ocean, support of the ocean. Yeah, I, I want to start by just saying I totally appreciate what what both Ian and Wendy have said. Um, Ian talking about the collection of data, right, being so important. I mean, how do we how do we save uh, what we don't truly understand? Um, and then also having that deep connection um, and just ocean literacy and being able to spread that to younger generations um, with the work that Wendy is doing is so critical because I really do think that creating solutions um, is what we, where we need to start you know, putting ourselves. And it's not, there's no one silver bullet that's going to solve the ocean's challenges. Um, it's going to take um, thousands, tens of thousands of, of innovative solutions. Um, so I really think it's a connection between um, ocean literacy, data, policymakers, and then I, you know, with, with what we stand for at Sustainable Ocean Alliance, we're looking at innovators, we're looking at leaders, we're looking at what, what, who is the, you know, people engine and solutions engine that's going to be able to um, solve these challenges. And I think first and foremost, it's also worth mentioning too that the ocean is extremely valuable, um, not only in the intangible things um, that it provides to us that, that are hard to measure, but also feeding billions of people, um, creating the air we breathe, you know, uh, the list goes on, govern, governing um, weather patterns um, globally. So just so important that I think we move from the, uh, you, know, you know, looking at the problem and talking about the problem. I mean, that's important, but I think the next step is really developing solutions. Um, and, the, the, you know, there are tangible values too. I think WWF some years ago put out a report that said the ocean's valued at $24 trillion if you just were to put a price tag on everything in it um, that, yeah, that the world considers a resource. Um, but I think we need to change our relationship with it. I think we've been exploiting it. Um, and the truth is, is we need it a lot more than it needs us. So we have to create um, businesses and um, just methods of, you know, working with the environment that aren't um, exploitive. Manny, do you think, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about Craig's point that we have to move from exploiting the ocean to cultivating the ocean and thinking about our role in, in treating the ocean as a possibly renewable resource, but only if we, if we conduct ourselves in a way that cultivates the ocean um, uh, going forward, learning about it and then figuring out how to keep it healthy? 
Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be here, part of this panel. Thank you so much. And, you know, from, uh, so Point Blue uh, Conservation Science is, we're a scientific NGO in California, and our mission is to advance conservation strategies on both terrestrial and marine systems. And um, although we work um, here in California and along the Pacific coast, we do have a research station in Antarctica and work across Latin America. And I think to your question, this is a really interesting question because one of the things that we're trying to do with our science is really empower communities to help shift that relationship with nature and help shift our relationship with the oceans. But in my mind, there are two components to it. One is really understanding what our effects are on the ocean or how much we need the, uh, the resources from the ocean. But there's another part about it that I'm not sure we uh, always spend enough time talking about. There are many communities who aren't part of this decision making, participating as part of this and don't see it. And we need to really make an effort to extend this um, sort of our data and our science and our ability to connect with these communities who have previously not been part of the discussions to empower them to really be part of the solution and to see why, how they're sharing in the benefits of this. So I think it's a two, a two pronged issue. How do we engage with, and I, and I love this idea of, you know, like, I think it starts early. It starts with K through 12 kids. We have um, one of the things that we're really proud of is our apprenticeship or internship programs where we're bringing early career scientists and really getting them involved. And But what we're hoping is that they go back within their communities and get excited and connect their communities to this work and shifting our relationship with the ocean and seeing how the resources there benefit them and their communities. Now, one of the things that I find to be really interesting is this interaction between um, uh, economic interests and the oceans. And one of the things that we we have done systematically is, for example, we disenfranchised indigenous communities, mm -hmm. communities that, that are not associated with larger businesses that have exploited the uh, ocean resources through traditional mechanisms. And we basically killed those industries. And that, it doesn't matter whether it's, it, it's in Southeast Asia or in the Alaska um, hunting grounds uh, for salmon, where the salmon stocks are, are beginning to, to tank because of what's going on in the oceans. How do we ensure, Manny's making this point about voices, about empowering voices. How do we empower voices so that it's not just some scientists or people who are exploiting the oceans or, or food producers or whatever, but it's really everyone with an interest in, in making sure that those uh, voices. Uh, um, Everyone, how do we how do we do that? Well, I mean, if you don't mind, if if I jump in here, uh, and by the way, to be clear, earlier on, I was saying that ocean research is a prerogative of the privileged because ocean research is is so expensive. But I think to the point that the panel have said, and and forgive forgive me if I use our sort of case scenario, but. We were developing a tool to, um, to conduct a health assessment of a live animal minimally invasively. And you know what? We called it Snotbot. And a lot of people didn't like that. But you know what? Kids loved it. And we found that often when you develop a tool like a hammer, a hammer is good at just hammering in a nail. But we found with these drones, we could collect exhaled breath condensate. We could do... Um, photogrammetry, we could do population studies, we could do behavior studies. And I think that's the whole point. It, it's almost breaking the mold. And I think everyone on this panel is from the, you know, the scientist on the white coat to letting people know that are into drones, that are into technology, that are into engineering, that are into biology. Almost as I said at the beginning, the oceans are downhill from everything. So that means people in Ohio need to care about the oceans and it's building those bridges. And honestly, I think everyone on this panel is, is doing a remarkable job at that. It's not easy, but I think, I think we're winning slowly. So, Ian, are you, are you basically saying that, that you, while the uh, development of data might be the purview of specialists like yourself, the actual provision of data in other words, empowering people with that data, that's a much more of a democratizing uh, impact. So you're giving people information that they can then use in their own ways. Is that is that part of what you're saying? 
Well, exactly. And I'm also trying to say, as again, the three panelists have said, science is an adventure. Exploring our oceans is an adventure. I don't, Nancy Drew, Indiana Jones, it's not somebody in a stereotype. And I think if we get people almost, as Manny said, it's like this isn't a challenge here. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to sort of be the most revered population ever. Because, as you know, we're going to be in 100 years time, they're going to look back and say, you folks knew, and what did you do? Do you know what I mean? So this is sort of the greatest opportunity that's been given any generation before us. And I hope you can tell. I'm certainly excited by it, as, as are my peers here. And we took a, we took a poll in which, uh, um, if you took a look at the answers of, of why the oceans are important, one was uh, preserving biodiversity and, and a food source, right? Everybody can get behind what we eat, and everybody can get behind this idea that we need to have a uh, redundant uh, planet. We have to have a, a planet that, that is thriving. Um, how do you look, Craig, about th this whole idea of sharing the knowledge that you have? And do you create this knowledge in bite-sized uh, pieces so that Wendy can make sure that the, her K through 12 students have access to it? Uh, Manny, you might want to um, to weigh in as well. Are, are you packaging up your knowledge so that it can be easily uh, shared by people at, at different levels from the policy level to the specialists to the K through 12 folks? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think uh, part of what Sustainable Ocean Alliance does um, is really to spread ocean literacy, um, is really to create coursework and curriculum um, that you know, young people, um, our target demographic is under 35 for our ocean leadership program. And then we also have um, a program that supports innovators, a startup network, if you will, for developing ocean solutions. And so we want to make that knowledge accessible and build these communities, communities of like-minded people who are on the mission to heal the ocean in our lifetime. Um, and so what we really want to do is create um, those tools and resources that allow people to, to not just make oceans, uh, conservation, something that they volunteer on on the weekends, but um, something that they can truly make their, their life's work. So, Manny, uh, if yeah. you can weigh in, and then when, we're going to go to Wendy to see whether you all are doing a good enough job <laughs> of getting the information Wendy, uh, to Wendy, because she's going to be grading you all at the end of, at the end of this. Manny, do you want to? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And the, the thing about, like, we're in the data business in a lot of ways, right? We collect a lot of data. But the thing is that we don't collect the data on our own. Besides our cruises and our research biologists doing this work, we, we also rely on community science, right? And, and the ability to engage members of the community uh, to collect the science and own this science. But I do think there is a challenge here, especially as we reach out to more diverse communities. How do we package this data? How do we package this data in a way that's actionable? What we don't want is data sitting on a shelf. What we want is data not only sort of creating new thoughts and being actually implemented, but we want it being like, and uh, sort of creating new ideas and exciting people and connecting people. And one of the things that we do see is uh, seabirds or um, marine life is a great way to connect people to the ocean and the, the systems because they connect like in, in a very different way. So if we can just working with social scientists, for example, is a really powerful way to really rethink how we take this data and, and share it in a way that is more actionable and more empowering. Manny, do you have to listen more to people who are not experts in terms of what they need? Uh, you know, it would be great if, if all of you could, could also weigh in because part of what happens in the sciences is that experts talk to experts, right? But sometimes, you forget about talking to the person who is not an expert, but who needs the data, right? Which is, uh, Manny, that's that, that's partly your point. How do we do that? How do we make sure that our research is guided by people who are not experts, but who have expertise in terms of what they need to change their behavior and to affect their environment? I'll just say really quickly, yes, we have to listen to different groups like it, that that we that are not experts to really understand. But again, I think we need to work with social scientists and others to develop the proper questions. We may be stuck in the same questions, and we may need a broader set of tools of questions that we can really engage with to get the answers that we are not really used to getting. Wendy, you want to you want to jump in? Are, are you getting the data that you need, and how do you convey to experts like? 
uh, Craig and Manny and Ian and others, the scientists who are doing this fundamental research, how do you convey what is needed by by the people that, that you're serving to, to bind them to the oceans? Well, first of all, I think panels like this and conferences and other situations where we can all come together and you can hear what each other is doing. Um, you know, for me, I get the fireworks coming right off 4th of July, but going off in my head going, you know, I, I, for example, um, with the SNAPA, you know, we've worked with the, with you folks. I've worked with Dr. Dr. Ari Friedlander um, with track plot data for whales. You know, the kids see that it looks like a video game and they're already in. So part of it is making sure, you know, I have to hold myself accountable for being out there, reaching out, listening, and then how do I interpret what they've done and know and draw it down to a, five-year-old all the way up to a, you know, 65-year-old, 85-year-old. Um, so that's our job. Um, but it is also keeping our ear to the ground on what's coming out. So, so you're a supporter right. of, ed- of edutainment, right? You, yeah. You know, and it's interesting. People get a little offended by that word. I have no problem with it at all because it's the gateway to learning. Um, so for example, Minecraft, which I've never played, but I <laughs> am aware that it's a thing. Um, they had an add-on. I, I know there's some technical term for it, but had an ocean play plug in and they came to us to, you know, kind of craft up what they should include in that. And we grounded it in the ocean literacy principles. So the kids were, you know, having fun building their little Minecraft land, but doing it from an ocean perspective. Um, So that was a fun one. We also had this idea of marketing it in a way that's interesting. So meet them where they are and bring them to where you want them to be. Uh, we did a stoked on surf conference where we looked at wetsuit technology or citizen science fins for surfboards and, you know, meteorologists talking about, you know, um, surf reports and how that comes to be, but then that ocean um, weather connection and why we should care. Um, So it's, you know, I think that's the fun part of the work um, is making it doable, not daunting. Um, So some of these ocean problems, if the elephant's too big, how do you even start to take a bite? Um, But breaking it down in pieces and making it motivating I think that's the fun part. And when we do a good job at that, we we can see the difference that it makes when we do pre and post um, reports or tests with kids. And if I can see that their agency has changed, they're feeling that they can make a difference, then the rest will follow. That's, um, that's so that, that, that's so important. I love looking at, at their apps and renderings in which I can see ocean currents and the ocean current flows. I can see ocean temperature. I can see uh, wind patterns and so on. I mean, those renderings are just so wonderful. And that comes directly off of the work that you're doing, Ian, that you're doing, Craig, that you're doing, Manny. I can actually get a sense of of, a real live sense from sitting wherever I am in the world of what's going on in the oceans. And, And that is, for me, it's not only entertainment, but it's also informative because when I look at the patterns and I see how how the weather is changing, I can actually start to see where those thunderstorms are are hitting australia you know it's it, it's 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 really an interesting idea are are you all uh, connecting with with media and tech companies and and uh, and dealing with the whole issue of taking non-scientists like me and getting you, getting that's what i was describing in terms of marketing how are you how are you connecting those dots that are in unusual ways to get us all involved in this. Uh, Ian, you want to give a, give a cut on this? Well, yeah, although I'd like to endorse what Wendy said, and I do feel there's a little bit of a problem nowadays in that we're getting so much bad news dumped on us, do you know what I mean, that people get overwhelmed and get disenfranchised. So the idea of breaking it down into small pieces, and I feel everybody's got their own context and their own interests. So when you're talking to somebody, if you can understand their interests, their context, I bet, as Wendy would say, there's an ocean story you should put in there. I mean, we're certainly trying um, with, with the media, and we do a lot on, on sort of Instagram and, and, and Facebook. Um, it's a challenge, though, because, you know, producing – a, a sort of a a piece that everyone will watch that will educate people is not as easy as people would, would think, particularly when you only have a small budget. But um, certainly I think Ocean Alliance is throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And we're happy with that for now. So you're talking about producing films and that kind of, that kind of thing. And, and Wendy was talking about producing games. Are there other approaches, uh, Craig, Manny, that, that uh, you've, you've seen in terms of, getting different segments of society involved. For example, if I'm living in Kansas, I'm very far away from 
the ocean. If I'm if I'm in uh, Kansas City, you know, at the border of Kansas and, and Missouri, I'm not necessarily going to the ocean every day. How do I connect to the work um, at uh, in the oceans and the importance of that to my life? Because as Ian said, everything was running downhill. So if I am basically uh, buying um, a uh, a uh, a, uh, a cracker that's in a box that's in a plastic wrapper that comes in another box that has a big plastic wrapper around that. All that plastic is going to flow downhill. How do how do you connect me in Kansas City to the oceans? Anybody want to take that? Well, I'll just say that it, it is a real it is a real challenge. But we're part of a community, right? A, a part of a community, and that, that there's these experts and these wonderful people who can we can work with more. And I think part of the challenge is how do we work a little bit better together across sectors? Um, and you know, I, I think for us, we try to engage through community scientists. You know, the idea of um, re- like cams, like cameras that we have on our Fairland Islands Research Center. We have a camera there where people can just from anywhere in the world can log in and see the wildlife and see a lot of the what goes on there. And it's exotic and it's really interesting, but we're limited in our, our creative thinking. And I love partnerships to really expand our ability to, to do that. Yeah, I would I would just second that and just say that cross collaboration is is really key. And I even think about, I mean, I was in, I was graduating from college 11 years ago. So not that long ago. (laughs) Um, And I remember, you know, going through classes and focusing on, you know, studying as as, uh, studying ecology. Right. And all my upper division classes seem to be really focused in that. Right. And um, recently gone back and um, been pursuing a master's and at the same university, University of California, Santa Cruz, the program is completely different. There are courses, classes like Hacking for Oceans, where we're developing solutions to solve ocean challenges, where you have, you know, somebody who's trying to get their MBA, another PhD student, and a master's student in ecology, you know, all working together, or, or someone in policy. And that kind of cross-collaboration at university, I think, is so important, because that's what the real world looks like. That's how you solve these challenges outside of academia. You know, when you actually need to build a solution, you have to work with people with various different expertise and diverse, you know, opinions and um, and skill sets. Um, so I just wanted to, to harp on that. I think collaboration is is totally key in solving these seemingly insurmountable challenges. So well, and I would about- add, if I don't, if you don't mind, we have Go to ahead. give them the alternative. So you've got this cracker with the package and the box and the cracker and the, you know all this packaging, patching. So what else? What's the alternative? And I think if we can serve it up a little easier, you know, you think about things like QR codes, how much easier that made us, you know, we don't have to look at menus. We can, you know, things change when they have to. So if we have the urgency there, but we also point people to, you know, make that that alternative route really easy to find. And I don't know that we always do. And that's just, you know, something that we can, it gets back to your marketing and your education and, and all of that, but make it easy for people to do the right thing. And then they probably will. <laughs> Well, we had two, um, I, I'm going to give uh, Ian, you a last word and Manny a last word, uh, but we had we had two different polls. Uh, one was that it was interesting. Um, 80% of the people who responded say that the oceans are in the top 10 um, of, of the problems that we should be thinking of. And actually 40% of people said top three problems. Uh, very interesting. And then we also had another poll, which was called self-reflection. The poll asked, uh, what actions have you personally taken? And we had uh, donating to to others, um, reuse, recycle, and reinvest in efforts to reduce uh, pollution and educate myself and others on ocean conservation. Those were the only three answers that we got. It's all about personal responsibility, personal contributions, personal conduct. Uh, Ian, um, let's give you um, a, a word in terms of how we should think about the oceans and what we can do next. What is the action we ought to take? And then, Manny, uh, you'll take us out uh, with with uh, with your final thoughts, your admonition to us. But Ian, uh, what should what should I be doing today? Well, to just things? put things into perspective. Seventy one percent of this planet is water. You said at the beginning, two out of every three breaths we take come from our oceans. Humanity's future is ocean based. Humanity's future is blue. We've got to look ever more to the oceans. And right now, the oceans are in many ways our toilet. 
So we've got to reinvent and rethink and, and just think blue. I think it's an incredibly exciting time with technologies from collecting data to community data to partnerships. It's an exciting time to be thinking of planet ocean as against planet Earth. So your point is cultivate rather than ex rather than just exploit. In other exactly. words, we're we're living in in the ocean, whether we are actually immersed in it or not. We are living in the ocean, is what you're Blue saying. Blue blood is pumping through this this planet's heart. So yes, Manny, you want to take us out? Well, yeah. So two quick thoughts. One is that you know, as as the effects of climate change keep growing and the the oceans are impacted by that, I think the thing that we do have to recognize is it's not just the effects that we have to address, but the solutions that we choose. For example, offshore wind or mining or other issues. We need to take this moment and really recognize how we do better and how we really learn from the lessons and. And the oceans provide us that opportunity to really take a care, to care to understand what the challenges are, and and move forward with with better knowledge and and do better in terms of how do we sort of balance the need for resources and living with with these uh, really important but fragile systems. But the second thing, I, I kind of want to have this optimistic note. One of the things that we do have, we have a lot of apprenticeships, and we're seeing more and more diverse apprenticeships apprentices coming to us and bringing the urgency with them and new ideas. And that's exciting to me, like having these younger people come in and excited, understanding the urgency, looking at new tools, like different ways of social media and just and, and from different communities that I find exciting. And, and it, it sort of gets me really uh, up, feeling optimistic about what we can do together. I think that, that a big piece of this is also listening to each other. You know, people who live close to a resource and, and are in daily dialogue with it, whether they have the advanced degrees or whether they even have um, a, a uh, level of educational literacy, they are expert in their own environment. If we just listen to people who are very close to the resource, who have been fishing for generations and have been um, living close to salmon fisheries or shrimp fisheries, or um, they, they have been um, using the ocean as their uh, livelihood uh, for centuries, they have a lot to tell us and they can become engaged in this research if we just listen. It, it's really on us to not feel uh, so confirmed in our expertise that we shut out uh, knowledge that, that might not come with uh, multisyllabic words but that can really be, be so very helpful in informing our actions. Dr. Ian Kerr, CEO of the Ocean Alliance in Massachusetts, Dr. Wendy Marshall, CEO and President of the Ocean Institute in California, Craig Dudenhofer, a Chief Innovation Officer of Sustainable Ocean Alliance and the Ocean Solutions Accelerator, uh, co-founder in California, and Manny Oliva, uh, CEO of Blue Point Conservation Science in California. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom with us, your work, your people are just wonderful. Thank your boards. Thank your donors. Thank your staffs. And, and really, it's just been a real pleasure to, to, to have you here. On Thursday, we're going to be talking about uh, aid to, uh, to uh, the brave Ukrainians who are, uh, uh, who are fighting this, this idea of, of, um, of using power to take over um, uh, uh, countries. This, this really has got to stop. It's all part of this sort of civil society thrust that, that we all have. Thank you, everybody stay safe. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. day. Cheers.